Uh, and now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, who is the lovely Kat Lavers. Um, Kat's been delivering this series of webinars with us. Um, so for those who don't know Kat, she's a passionate gardener and sustainable food systems advocate. She has a background in permaculture design, teaching and facilitation. Um, and as you'll learn today, her work connects people with the land under, her, under our feet and um, helps us all understand our role in the wider ecosystem, um, which is always important to understand. So handing over to you now, Kat. Thank you so much, Beck, And um, hello, everybody. It's so good to be here with you for the last uh, session in this series. It's been a real treat to be able to share my passion with all of you over the last few months. And before I say anything else, I, I also just want to acknowledge, of course, that I'm on Wurundjeri land today and me and all of the creatures that I'm about to introduce you to uh, are part of Wurundjeri country. And um, I, I want to acknowledge the significant and ongoing role that Indigenous people all around the world play in stewarding these ecosystems, keeping them going, keeping them healthy. And these are skills that we, um, we, we need to urgently relearn. And so I'm hoping that in a very small way, this session will contribute to uh, starting to understand some of the ecosystems that are around us and how we can be healthy and um, functioning participants in all of them. So I'm gonna bring up some um, slides to share with you and um, with them lots and lots of photos and um, hopefully some videos as well and talk about the goal for today's session so i know many of you are coming with specific pests in mind and problems that you need to solve so i'm going to go through uh, what i reckon are probably the top 10 pests or categories of pests that people ask me about all the time and some of the quick fixes that you can turn to but of course we're also going to go through how to prevent the issues in the first place some uh, attitudinal principles to approaching the problem how to think through a longer and perhaps more strategic approach to your pest issues and talk about right at the end how we plan a strategy what we're not going to be able to do today is solve every one of your pest problems. I, I don't know every pest that's out there for one. Um, I um, need to go look things up from time to time as well, of course. So what we're really going for here is an approach and helping you to help yourself uh, by knowing where to start and what to try. So what we'll do is um, go through those quite common categories. We're going to pause for some questions. Uh, if there's anything that's hanging at the end of the session, then I'm most happy to stay until most questions are answered. Um, one time we were here for half an hour after the session, so hopefully we uh, will not be that long. Um, but we can stay and manage some of those questions that pop up throughout. So the, the goal here is really um, a philosophy and a, strat a strategy to help you approach these pest problems rather than each individual pest per se. So uh, to start us off, I thought I'd um, give you a picture of one of my cabbages. You're going to see quite a few pictures of my cabbages today because they have lots of pests on them at the moment. And this is taken from a couple of weeks ago and obviously there's something going on here. So before we go into anything, I want to invite you to look at that picture and just take note of your response. Um, what are you thinking when you see that cabbage? What's your instinct at this stage? And I wonder, I will be very curious to see whether that's changed at all or not at the end of the session. So think about what um, might be causing the damage and what step you might like to take, and maybe now and in the future. Now, just imagine when you're inspecting that cabbage, I do a lot of inspecting at home. So when you're looking at those leaves, maybe turning them over, rustling around in the mulch, let's imagine that you come across some eggs and I'm going to invite you, if you like, to have a guess of what those eggs are. And if you feel brave, you can pop that in the chat window and um, let me know. And we'll see if anyone can pick what those eggs are. I'm going to give you a little strategic silence here. Kay says it looks exactly like my cabbage. Excellent. Well, we're going to cover it. Um, we've got caterpillars, cabbage moth. Uh, they're not real sized, Rowena, so they'll be pretty small compared to the picture. Heather says they're eggs. So Heather so far is the only person who's genuinely correct. <laughs> and Liz, Liz, you've got it. So Liz has actually said it's a ladybird, but with question marks. So let's follow the chain here. Those eggs are going to hatch into larvae. And this is what the larvae of a ladybird looks like. 
And you've no idea how many times people have brought me one of these to a workshop and said, these are all over my plants. How do I kill them? <laughs> so uh, I guess one of the things to know is that unless we know what something is, it's really important not to kill it. Uh, those larvae are going to turn into this pupil form that you can now see. And that pupil form is, of course, going to turn into the ladybirds that we know and hopefully love. Those ladybirds, by the way, are going to turn into some of your greatest garden allies uh, that like to suck the guts out of ladybirds and stay on patrol for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So when you're inspecting something, there, there can be a very strong instinct to crush particularly eggs and particularly things that we don't know. Um, one of the first uh, little lessons in here, I guess, is try, try to withhold that judgment until we know a little bit more. So the first thing we need to know is how do we identify who is truly to blame? Because the insects that we see the most of may not be the ones that are actually doing the damage. So uh, I find things in the garden all the time that I don't know um, the identity of. Uh, firstly, of course, we start by examining the leaves to see if we can find some creatures. And as you become a little bit more experienced, you'll start to see patterns in droppings in maybe trails that creatures leave, in uh, the way that they damage the plant. So now I could look at a hole in a leaf and I can often tell whether that's an earwig or a caterpillar or a slug and snail or a or possum, for example. Um, so we won't be doing a lesson on different types of poo today. I'm sure you're all happy about that. Um, but that is something that you can learn to pick up over time. Next thing is to go out at night. I'm going to give you a, an example from last night in just a minute. Um, but the key is that many of these pests are active during the night because that's when some of their predators, namely birds, uh, are asleep. So night is the safe time for them. And if you can't see them doing the damage during the day, if you head out there at night, you might see them in the act and it can be quite eye-opening. Another trick you can do is take a hostage. Um, so I've got a couple of little jars on my desk at the moment. I'm holding one up right now to the camera where I haven't been able to identify something and I've taken a, a hostage and seen what it turns into or um, gotten a closer look at it so that I can look it up more accurately. Um, uh, you can also take photographs and ask on social media and um, so, for example, the one on the right hand side, the picture you can see here is something that I haven't been able to identify yet. And um, I know there's some very experienced gardeners in this session. And so, in fact, for this and throughout the session, if you do pick something up or see something missing, feel free to pop that in the chat and then we can all learn. And uh, also, if you've tried other things or you disagree with some of the things that I've put up, that'd be really great and really rich information. So feel free to share throughout the session. Uh, so feel free to ask on social media and there are some groups like really specialized groups where people are so happy to help you identify things. So you can crowdsource that example sometimes using uh, Facebook and other social media. Occasionally, you'll be able to do a reverse image search. So through search engines, um, you can put in a photograph and it will bring up similar photographs. And this doesn't always work, uh, but sometimes you can click on something that's similar and see that identified and work out who it is from there. There are lots of field guides where you can look up the fauna of a particular area and some of them um, have uh, specific field guides for insects. Um, the one that I've used a little bit of is Museum Victoria's field guide and I can see a couple of people in the chat saying I naturalist which is new to me and so that's one I'll be checking out after the session thank you very much uh, there's also a book called what garden pest or disease is that um, by Judy McMore and this is a pretty uh, fat chunky reference book if you've got something strange that you'd like to look up and you can be bothered flicking through you know a couple of hundred pages until you find the right photograph um, and then the final one I wanted to give you is the Museum Victoria actually have an identification service where you can send them in a sample or you can send them in a really high quality photograph. And as far as I'm aware, that's a free service, which is a pretty amazing thing. Uh, but maybe don't overuse that for stuff that you can find during the other methods, because I'm sure they're busy people at Museums Victoria. 
So there's a few ideas for how you might work out what's actually going on in your garden and who the culprit is. Um, this is always the first step because we cannot design a safe, effective, um, organic targeted strategy until we actually know who the culprit is. Because uh, as you'll see, there's different methods and approaches for all of these different pests. So again, one of the temptations is to reach for some kind of general insect knockdown spray, um, which of course I'm gonna discourage you from doing for your own health and the health of the other species that you share your garden with. Um, but absolutely um, critical is, is working out who this culprit is before we go any further. Okay, so I promise you we're gonna go on night patrol and um, uh, I wanted to show you what that can look like because I actually went out last night and, um, uh, and it was a bit of fun and pretty eye-opening, I will say. Um, so let me just open that video. We've been having a problem on Zoom where if I have multiple videos open at once, it actually plays the wrong one for you. So this is slightly slower than I'd hope, but I am gonna just have to open each video one by one to share them with you. Okay, so we're going on night patrol. Oh, okay, we're not going on night patrol. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it seems been very uncooperative lately. I'm going to try opening that with VLC instead. And then let me call that up. Okay, hoping you can see that. Beck, let me know if you can. Yep, can see it. It's a bit. It's a little bit choppy, isn't it? A bit choppy. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to pause it at particular points because I'm not quite sure what's causing that problem. And I'll show you what I found along the way. This is taken at about 11 o'clock last night before I went to bed. <laughs> so I went out there. I actually thought that I cleaned up a lot of snails using the techniques that I'm going to show you in a minute. But have a look what I found. I found these cheeky ones. Um, and then I zoomed in a little bit further and on the ground and I found this little conference of baby earwigs which is interesting um, and then I went somewhere else and I found more snails let's see if I'm clicking in the right spots yep more snails over there and some slugs even more snails yep and then they were just everywhere <laughs> so I found about 40, I reckon, about 40 young snails um, in one quick survey of my cabbage patch by going out at night. And that's after doing the things that I'm about to show you. I also um, noticed that most of them were quite young snails. So the sign for me there is that I've let them go through a breeding cycle and now I have a much, much bigger problem to manage. I'm also noticing in this video that that really young population of earwigs is probably one of the first population peaks as we move into the spring period where they become a problem in my garden. So if I'm acting now and early with those earwigs, I can prevent that population from building up. And um, I've kind of missed the boat for the snails. So now I'm gonna to have to work a little bit harder to bring that population um, back under control. So um, going out at night, I can't recommend it enough and it will open your eyes to what is actually going on when you're out in the garden. Uh, so I've put some big blue bubbles to try and highlight some of these little um, lessons that I've learnt along the way as we go through the presentation. So the first one is you need to have timely intervention. Uh, getting onto things when they're small problems, not waiting for them to become big ones. And if you can work out who is the problem, try and see when their peak breeding times are so that you can get ahead of them and start that management before their populations peak and preferably before you plant fragile little seedlings or seeds into the bed. Okay, we're gonna talk now about aphids and um, some other soft bodied sap sucking pests. It's probably the most, some of the most common pests that show up in your garden. And these all have the characteristics of being quite small and um, breeding extremely rapidly and they act on the plant by sucking its sap out. They're like little vampires, if you like, which um, weakens the plant, but they can also have some other effects like uh, bringing diseases with them as well. 
and um, sometimes they have complicating factors. So the image just here that I've pulled up is my lemon verbena plant. And um, if you can see my mouse, I've got lots of aphids on this leaf, but there is something else that's going on here and that's the black powdery stuff. So what's actually happening is these aphids are putting out a sweet liquid and um, that is attracting a fungus which is causing this black um, soft um, mold on the leaves. So sooty mold is something that will show up um, in many different plants, but is quite common in citrus plants if you have them. We've also got white fly, which are quite hard to see in this picture, but there's some uh, larger versions there. And um, yet yeah, white fly are basically aphids with wings, pretty similar um, life and control methods. Now, one thing you should know about some of these pests is they have allies, that they have a team that supports them when they're out there. And in this picture, we've actually got ants farming scale insects. Um, so, so ants are actually farmers. And like we have cows, the ants have aphids and um, scale and some of these other small pests. The reason the ants are interested in them is because of this sticky liquid that I was talking about before. And um, that's their milk, if you like. And of course, we know that ants love all these sweet things. So the ants will actually collect that sweet, li sweet liquid and feed it um, back to their colony. Um, this is actually a scale insect in Paraguay. Um, so not one of the local ones that we get around here. And I've seen this amazing video in a rainforest, more of a tropical um, context, where the ants can sense when the rain is about to come and um, the, when the rain comes, they pick up their little aphid cows or scale insect cows, and they put them under leaves until that rain is finished. And then when they put them back out, they put them on fresh pasture, if you like, but they rotate them around the plant to the best, most tender, juicy leaves. They also have apparently a special way of holding the female um, pregnant uh, scale insects so that they don't damage them. Uh, and really a very, very complicated and quite extraordinary relationship. So, <laughs> so ants uh, do lots of great things for us and they actually help other pest issues, but um, they can be a problem when they're defending some of the pests that we want to remove. So I'm gonna talk quite a bit about uh, lots of ways to tackle these pests. But the one thing that you should know is if you've got ants on duty, some of them won't be effective. So we, we need to control ants to get rid of some of these pest issues. And one of your options is um, using a horticultural glue, the photo of which I've just popped up for you. This is a glue that doesn't ever dry, so it remains sticky and it catches anything that tries to crawl over it. And if you've got a problem, say, with a citrus tree, which is quite common, you could put a band of this horticultural glue around the trunk and that will prevent the ants from climbing the trunk into the tree. Um, and without the ants there, then some of the natural predators of these critters are going to be able to be more effective. And don't worry, we're gonna meet those predators very soon. Okay, so um, when I see a plant that's infested with white fly or infested with aphids, really, really serious levels, my first instinct now is forget about the plant, let's have a look at the soil. And um, the photograph that I showed you here with the white fly is on a geranium leaf in my garden. And it's actually one of the few plants that has any of these pests on it at the moment. And the reason why they're all over this geranium is because that's the geranium plant. Uh, this is a rescue plant that I've adopted from um, a, a previous owner uh, and it basically didn't get planted on a horticultural job that they were doing. So the plant has sat far too long in this little pot. It's dried out, it's running out of nutrients, it's really sad and sick. So the aphids, or the white fly rather, are there as indicators that this plant is unhealthy. Um, so the creatures that we call pests have important jobs in ecosystems. They're actually decomposers decomposers that are starting to take that plant apart and um, make way for something new to grow in its place. As well, of course, as being food for other creatures that we're about to meet. The key here though, is that it doesn't matter what you do to the pests, 
if the plant is stressed and unhealthy, it is going to be a magnet for them. And um, you won't be able to control them effectively using some of these other quick fix methods. Uh, so um, that means looking after your soil and it means choosing the right spot for the right plant. So don't put a plant that needs a lot of sun in a very shaded position, for example. Now, of course, um, we can't go into heaps of depth on that today, but happily, we ran a soil session as part of this series. So I know that you will be able to access the recording of that and go back through and get all those tricks and techniques that are really important for uh, maintaining that really healthy soil and also some good design tips in another session. Okay, leaf miners um, are slightly different, but we can treat them in a similar way to some of those other small soft-bodied pests. And commonly they show up on leaf miners. I also see them in brassica plants like broccolis uh, quite regularly. And this is my citrus tree outside at the moment. And um, this is a multi-graph, by the way, if you're wondering why there's a lot of fruit on one side, it's because we've eaten the other half, which ripened about a month early. And um, so I've zoomed in on the tips here so you can see the, the curled leaves and um, blown up one of those leaves so you can see the little tunnels that are made by this tiny little caterpillar that gets in between the tissue of the leaf and starts tunneling around. Now it doesn't look great at the tips, but I have to say um, my approach here is actually do nothing <laughs> at this stage um, because I'm still getting a fantastic crop from this tree. The tree otherwise is really strong, um, it's really healthy, uh, I've got no other indications that the plant is suffering and I know from previous observation that the leaf miner comes and goes at this time of year every year without really affecting the long-term growth of the tree. So my only thought here is am I creating a bigger problem for my neighbours with leaf miner? Um, not many of my neighbours are growing citrus in my immediate block. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's kind of a thing of, do I need to do some control for the general good or can I just leave it? And at this stage, I've decided I'm, I'm just going to leave it um, because I'm still getting what I need from this tree. If I were to take action, the first thing that I would do here is try using a white oil. And that white oil that I've just put up on the screen is a really simple homemade safe and effective spray that you can use on leaf miners, on aphids, on um, scale insects and on whitefly um, and quite a lot of other soft bodied sap sucking small pests. This spray actually works by suffocating them so it's an oil and it coats them and stops them from breathing. Uh, so yeah not, not super nice for those little pests um, but very, very safe for your health and for the health of other species. If you want to make this at home, it's um, about one cup of vegetable oil and about half a cup of the simplest, most natural dishwashing liquid you can get your hands on. And then you dilute it extremely heavily. Uh, so we're talking about a tablespoon for a litre of water. And we don't spray this in hot weather because that little layer of oil can burn your plants if there's intense sun. And you need to get full coverage of all of the plant and surfaces so that you make sure you are covering this pest. Um, that's an intervention that you could try and do as a bit of a quick fix to this problem um, if it's happening to you. So a little lesson there is that we're trying to go for management here and not necessarily control. And believe it or not, a consistent and low level of pests is necessary. So what we want is just a moderate level year round that's enough to attract and maintain predators in your garden um, that we're going to talk about in a minute. So the longer term goal, so not, not the quick fix, but the longer term approach is to have a balanced ecosystem where other creatures are doing most of the control for you. Um, with sprays, um, as I've said, we're going, going for cheap and simple, safe options first. Sometimes those are not as effective as the commercial sprays. Um, that's probably, probably pretty obvious, but you won't um, get a same, sort of same level of efficiency usually with the homemade spray. That doesn't mean that they're not worthwhile and often that's enough control to bring the problem um, under control. 
Um, but we're not going for complete control, as we said, we're just going for a, a lower level of these pests. If you do need to step it up a little bit, if you've run out of other options or it's an extremely valuable crop, then one of the options that you've got is something like a pyrethrum spray, which if it's a naturally sourced one is made from a daisy. Um, but I, I bring this up as an example for you, because you need to be aware that it also can kill bees, um, which of course are essential for humans and um, very important members of our ecosystem community. Uh, so there are lots of trade-offs once we start getting into those higher levels of control, um, which is why I'm really focused in on some of these more simple options, even if they're not quite as effective um, all the time. There are also, by the way, synthetic forms of pyrethrum, and there are natural forms of pyrethrum that have synthetic synergens in them. So you have to look quite hard and it's quite expensive to find an organic certified one. Um, I've, I can see in the chat that um, there's a few other options that people have tried at home. Uh, so in between these two, yes, absolutely. Try um, sprays made from garlic and chili. Uh, try soap sprays. Um, try pest repellent plants like wormwood teas and so on. Um, so I, I'm only going to give you the ones that I've tried and use at home, uh, but do pop those in the chat and um, make a note of those if you're interested in trying them. Okay, so you've heard me say a bit of a laissez-faire approach of just leave it and it's going to be okay. And of course, we've got to go the opposite of that, um, which is where you need to jump on some of these problems quickly. If you followed that first step of identification, then hopefully you'll know which path you need to take. One of the examples where we need to act quickly and really get on top of a pest problem is some um, fruit fly. And um, fruit fly, unfortunately, is starting to take hold in Melbourne. Uh, so it's, um, it's been on the way. <laughs> uh, this year was the first year that it showed up at my place, uh, which was a really sad moment, a very big, big sinking feeling in my stomach, I must say. And it showed up in our Fajoas first. Now I'm gonna see if I can share another video with you without it going completely kaput. And um, I'll bring up a video of the fruit fly larvae so that you can see what they look like when you open the fruit. Has anyone else got fruit fly by the way? I'd love to know, pop it in that chat window and where you are. We do a little um, crowdsourced survey of uh, Melbourne. Let's see. Oh, this is so annoying. Becky, are you seeing a black screen there? Yeah, I can see the black screen. I don't know what's going on with Zoom. Um, I will open it again in VLC and see if I can get a better version for you, or at least freeze a frame so you can see those larvae. Angela's got some fruit fly in Sunbury, as does okay. Rihanna, but in Queensland. <laughs> right, okay. So Sunbury, yeah, yeah. yep, definitely here. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause it. I'm really sorry about the video not working so well. Uh, hopefully you can see that little larvae there. I'm just gonna circle it with my mouse. They look like a grain of rice and they wriggle around a lot. They actually jump about 10 centimeters, which is freaky when you see it first up. And if you open your fruit, the fruit can actually look quite okay on the outside. And then you open it up and you see these larvae um, making a real mess of the inside. Um, so that's what you need to look out for, folks. If you see them, it's time to get meeting quickly. Um, so uh, your options for fruit fly, um, well, they are a tricky pest. Uh, so let's just be clear to start with that about 70% of um, our sort of common backyard fruit trees are susceptible. So that's why I say it's a really serious pest that we should try and manage um, urgently when it comes up. Uh, so uh, one of the options that we've got as a home gardener is using nets that exclude the fruit fly and stop them from laying eggs on your fruit as it's developing. And of course they need to be very fine nets um, because these insects are about a centimetre uh, wide. Uh, so they're gonna need to be very fine. Oh, and Jan said tomatoes are susceptible too, and that's true. Tomatoes and capsicums, um, some of our most cherished vegetables, in fact, are also susceptible as well as the fruit trees. So um, give nets a go. Uh, the other option that we've got is a protein bait for the female fruit fly. 
And um, protein baiting attracts the females because they need to have a protein meal before they can lay eggs. So you can buy organic certified protein baiting, but the catch is that we don't know yet how wide you have to make that bubble of, um, of baiting. And it's likely that you might need to do it with your whole block. Uh, so you can have a little coordinated neighborhood fruit fly response. It might be a nice way to meet your neighbors or not, uh, but you will have to do that probably wider than your average suburban block. Um, as Nadine says, you're gonna stop pollinators as well if you do put a fine net over your trees. So you will need to keep that in mind. And um, there, there are gonna be some trade-offs here. Uh, uh, cleaning up fallen fruit is important, but only if um, there, there's a chance that that will have had eggs laid in it because the fruit fly are not attracted to ripe fruit once it falls on the ground. If um, that fruit does contain the larvae as my fajoas did this year, then we need to make sure that as much as possible, we're catching that fruit and um, dealing with it before those larvae can turn into adults and start another pest cycle. So any fruit that you think is suspicious, I would be doing something like um, freezing it if you've got enough space in your freezer for a couple of days or solarizing it, putting it in a black plastic bag in the sun for a couple of days uh, or cooking it on your stove are doing something that's going to wipe out any larvae and um, stop them from um, emerging. So fruit fly is a tricky one and um, really, really important to jump on top of. And um, this brings me to what probably one of the most important prevention steps that you can take for pests, which is uh, biosecurity. And this is a word that we don't talk about a lot in the home garden context, but I have this feeling that we probably should. Uh, because the easiest way you can solve some of these pest issues is just avoiding bringing them in in the first place. And of course, that means also following quarantine restrictions really carefully when you're travelling, because these are the um, rules that keep other gardeners safe and also other farmers and horticultural industries safe as well. Uh, so I follow qu qu quarantine quite religiously and I look things up if I'm going to move them between states and I go and check ask permission if need be, do what you need to do to make sure that you're not um, part of the problem um, where this is concerned. Another example of biosecurity in an animal sense is that I visited some friends recently whose chickens had a respiratory disease and so I was walking around, um, you know, muddy ground, um, spending some time with their chickens. When I came home, I washed all those clothes and I scrubbed my boots with soapy water and washed my hands carefully to make sure that I didn't introduce that respiratory disease inadvertently to my quail. Um, I also have a, a little snail that has shown up at my place that wasn't here when I first started gardening. And it's a tiny little one that you'll see a photo of in a minute. And I'm sure that I've accidentally introduced those somehow. So it's a little note here about being a bit suspicious about things that are brought into your property, um, particularly if people, um, other gardeners give you cuttings or, or plants actually cuttings are probably one of the better things because there's no soil and they're very clean and easy to inspect but if you've got um, a potted up plant in someone else's soil i would be maybe bare rooting it and or at least doing a really good inspection before transplanting that into your place all right next up um, we've got earwigs uh, so <laughs> earwigs is an example for us where we tried lots of things before we discovered an approach that was working well. Uh, so earwigs, uh, the standard advice is an oil trap, so a bit of linseed oil or just vegetable oil with some soy sauce. And sometimes I got hundreds and often I got none, um, but that's something that you could try at home. Then there were tricks like rolled up newspapers and trapping them in there. Uh, and we tried some of those and they were moderately effective. Um, but what actually really worked was when we started really looking at our garden and seeing where the earwigs were hiding. And it turns out they were hiding in bits of bamboo that we were using as stakes in the garden. And I should say the earwigs actually were um, attacking our seedlings, like absolutely demolishing them in springtime for a couple of years in a row. And I was desperate, it was very, very hard to manage them at first. So after noticing that they like to shelter in the bamboo, I did an audit of all of our stakes and I made sure that none of the bamboo had easy little um, entry points and um, nooks for them to hide in. 
And I took those bits of bamboo that did, chopped them up, laid them in the garden and created traps for them. And the photo on the left here is I'm shaking those bamboo traps into a little container where we then take them and go and feed them to our very, very excited uh, little flock of quails who of course love them as a little protein snack to get them through the day. So we've actually gone from a situation of having an earwig problem to harvesting those earwigs and turning them into a real bonus, a real solution. And um, we did that just by obs observation. Uh, the permaculture principle observation and interaction um, is the key one here. So this little bubble is about innovating and using your observation to guide your experimentation. And the more that you can learn about the pests, the more you can learn to think like an earwig and just experiment until you come up with something that's effective. Um, I'm loving the little tips that you're popping in the chat as well. So please keep them coming for what you've tried at home. Okay, the next one is slugs and snails. And uh, there's a few examples here that I've um, pulled out from my garden. Uh, we've got some snails on the right hand side. And, and yes, I did actually do a photo shoot with quails yesterday of different ages and sizes. And here you can see the little conical shells, um, which are the smaller ones that I was talking about that I'm sure I've brought in, unfortunately. We also have a lot of slugs, um, but these slugs, these slugs are actually interesting. And let me know in the chat window if you, if you know what those ones are. Yeah, there's uh, complicating factors with them. Do you know what type of slugs they are? Oh yeah, Angela does. She said they're leopard slugs. And so leopard slugs are actually, um, they, they're actually carnivores or omnivorous, I should say. They uh, eat some types of snail. Um, they also clean up rotten uh, leaf litter and fungi. Uh, so I actually very rarely see them on my silver beet, for example. They can eat it, but I often choose not to. So these are not really the target of my um, pest management uh, these days. Uh, and of course, we know that the sort of damage um, that you get for slugs and snails tends to have these silvery trails attached to it and often quite large uh, rounded chunks that are taken out of the leaf. Uh, by the way, if you come across these, that's what a snail or a slug egg looks like. Uh, so just be warned if you see them. And look how many eggs can come from just one um, breeding cycle. Uh, so that's clearly happened a lot at my place recently, which is why I'm now chasing my tail a little bit at doing some other control methods. Now, I've got um, a bit of a poll that I was going to have a go at launching at now. So I'm going to, I think I can launch it from in here. I want you to have a look at those silver beet leaves and tell me at what point you would intervene. Um, what is the acceptable damage for you? Let's see, do a bit of a live poll. Where do you start to take action? I'm gonna give you five more seconds. Okay, that's enough there. Let's have a look at the results. I might have asked you a bit of a leading question in there when I said more holes than leaf. <laughs> um, but this is interesting. So uh, about a quarter of you would intervene if you saw one or two holes. Half of you would intervene if you saw quite a few holes in the middle. And another quarter of you would intervene for the uh, right hand side picture. Um, so that, that is fascinating and I, I wish someone would tell the supermarkets <laughs> um, because in a supermarket system the leaf on the left hand side is uh, unacceptable and would not be able to be sold in most shops. And um, with crops like silver beet and spinach they are being sprayed sometimes with two or three different pesticides multiple times a week to maintain the perfect picture perfect produce that you see on shelves in supermarkets. So what this little bubble is about is learning for you what is acceptable damage and maybe questioning yourself a little bit further and saying, well, is it really a problem if I've got a couple of little holes in that leaf? Uh, in this case, you're probably gonna cook the silver beet leaf. So you won't actually see any difference in your final product. So for me, I'm still very happy 
uh, with eating the silver beet leaf on the right hand side. Although if I start to get to the middle leaf, I go, all right, I think I've got a problem. I might need to intervene and make sure it doesn't develop too much further. Um, so yes, you can absolutely cook silver beet leaves with lots and lots of holes in them, no worries. And thank you for the extra artwork that someone's contributed for me on the screen as well. And so yes, this one is about asking yourself, do I need to take action? And is it a problem? And um, you can all draw your own lines uh, there in different places. Now, I'm not actually sure if I can erase those lines, but that's okay, we'll just keep going. So back to slugs and snails. Having decided that I seem to have an awful lot of them out there and I might need to take some action, my next thought is um, what do slugs and snails like? Uh, what are their favourite places to hide? And how do they like to move around the garden and under what circumstances? So you can see here on the photo, one of their favourite hiding places is this little dry sheltered nook underneath one of my large pots. And so one of the first things I can do is just go and check all my pots, scrape all of these out and then feed them to the quail. Uh, what I can also do is mimic these hiding places. And that's what I've done quite a bit of recently. And to do that, it's as simple as just chucking some of my seed raising punnets upside down uh, near the areas that have obviously got some snail damage. And you can see on the top photo, after a couple of days, they become a shelter site that I can then quite easily just knock into a bucket. Uh, and again, harvest as a useful protein food for my quail. Uh, I can also do a bit of a sweep around garden beds and edges. So the edges of my raised beds that have a bit of dichondra that creeps up against them um, turn into these little nesting sites. So of course I sweep uh, through those regularly. And this is a little bit of a side note, but when you're designing your veggie patch, it's a good idea to make sure that it's easy to check for pest hiding spots. Because uh, one of my first garden designs that involved lots of loose bricks ended up being basically like a, a giant hotel complex for slugs and snails and it was reasonably difficult to inspect. Uh, so thinking about how we'll actually manage pests when you're designing your garden um, can give you a bit of an easier time. And um, another thing that I do quite a bit of are setting beer traps. Uh, although, and tell me what you find out there in the chat window folks, but I usually find slugs in my beer traps. I don't often find snails in there. So I don't know, slugs seem to be a little bit more attracted to them. And they are actually attracted to the, the yeast in there, not the beer itself. So if you don't have a little bit of beer lying around, you can try using things like Vegemite diluted or a sugary solution with some bread yeast in it. Just experiment and see. Uh, Trish says the beer traps were not interested, uh, interesting for her snails. So maybe there's something in there. Um, I went out last night and checked one that I set just a few hours before. Right in the very corner, there was a slug in there already. So they, um, they can also work. All right, I'm gonna do caterpillars and then we're gonna come back and talk about predators and we'll have a chance to catch up some of your questions because I know there's been quite a few. Let's have a look at caterpillars first and, um, and then we'll have that chance to pause. So caterpillars, uh, come in many shapes and sizes, of course, and maybe you recognise some of the ones in this picture. And they come, of course, from eggs laid by moths and by butterflies. So it goes without saying then that if you do enjoy watching butterflies, it means you have to allow some caterpillars to live in your garden. Um, now, what type and, and how many? <laughs> That's up to you. Um, but knowing that they will sometimes turn into a very beautiful butterfly um, can sometimes help you change your mind about whether you need to squash them. And um, so we can play a little game here of matching the caterpillar to the moth or butterfly. So I'll help, help you out here. The, that of course is the cabbage white butterfly, which many of you will know, and it um, becomes one of these white butterflies here. We've got the diamond back moth right down in this bottom left hand corner, and that turns into this rather slender moth here in the center. And then we have the looper caterpillar over here, um, which then turns into 
uh, this moth over here. Um, now they come from eggs and that is an example of a cabbage moth egg. And these are really, really small. We're talking maybe one, maximum two millimetres long. And they are like little yellow bullets that get laid on the tops and the bottoms of the leaf. And when they hatch, at first they're really hard to spot. See if you can spot that caterpillar in the last image there. It's a tiny little one. I'll just circle it, oh, circle it with my, with my mouse. <laughs> So they do start off very small. If you see small holes, look for a small caterpillar. Okay, that's uh, not rocket science, but that can help you work out where and um, what, what to be looking for. Now we've got um, quite a few options with caterpillars. And um, I'm gonna start with one of the best examples of companion planting that I've come across so far. Uh, companion planting, it, it's not that it's um, wrong or bad, but often we don't know exactly why when we're doing something. And we look it up in a chart and it says, okay, put marigolds with um, tomatoes. But unless we actually know why it works, sometimes it won't be as effective. And so one of the great examples that has been um, scientifically uh, researched of late is this plant, which is called Barbaria verna. Uh, or there's a similar one, Bul Barbaria vulgaris. And um, I can try and put that in the chat window for you. Uh, from previous experience, the autocorrect turns it into Barbara. <laughs> Barbaria, let me try. Oh, good. Vulgaris or Verna. No, it's gone to Barbara. Anyway, you can, you can change that, it's Barbaria. And what this plant does is it actually attracts the moths uh, and the butterflies to lay their eggs on it uh, if they are from two species. Um, so that's the diamondback moth. Um, it also attracts another one I'm not going to talk about today and the cabbage white butterfly as well. So those butterflies will lay their eggs preferentially on this plant instead of your fragile cabbages and broccoli and kale and other plants in this brassica family. Oh, and thank you, Mary. Yes, it, its common name is called land cress. Um, but be warned, there's quite a lot of other plants that are called land cress as well. Uh, so what will happen is those eggs will hatch into caterpillars. And for some species, like the diamondback moth, it will actually kill them when they start eating this plant because of a substance called saponins in the leaf. For cabbage white butterflies, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's not going to kill them. It can, though, be a trap crop. So uh, you could um, pull it out and um, remove it uh, or just know that that's where most of those caterpillars are going to be when you go looking to squash them. Uh, so this is a great example of a plant that we, we do know has a, a big impact and something that you could try. And of course, you can take this principle and apply it to lots of other contexts by looking for the ones that the pests prefer to land on the most. The other approach that I take quite regularly on a very small scale is um, just hand picking or squashing. And um, it, it can seem quite backwards uh, and, and quite simple. And you can go, oh, maybe this is a bit inefficient, uh, which it might be in some contexts. But most of the time, this is as quick and simple as it gets. I've got an embedded video. Let's see if Zoom likes this one better. Oh, there we go. I don't know if you can see that egg. It is very small but there's a little yellow dot there and I've just rubbed it off with my thumb. Uh, so that's one approach that you can take, either squashing caterpillars or if you can find them squashing the eggs before they become the caterpillars. What I do a bit more of these days when I've got more um, larger brassica plants is use an exclusion net. Um, the, the broccolis and the cabbages don't need to have any pollinators at the stage that we tend to eat them. Um, so you don't have to worry about excluding other insects. Uh, but um, yeah, this, this is a great approach because if you can stop the moth or the butterfly from laying the eggs, you never get caterpillars developing. So that's what they look like. And then we get to a certain point, which for me was about three or four weeks ago, and the weather's cold enough. There aren't so many of those butterflies around. Uh, and then the nets actually can come off so that the sun can have full access in the winter and um, then there's not so much of a problem. So it's sort of a, a time strategy uh, of managing those pests 
when they're active. Another strategy that I have for that cabbage white butterfly is um, actually just not growing some of these crops over the summer because that's when those butterflies are most active and most difficult to control. So we only tend to grow these sorts of crops over winter and by the end of winter I'm actually quite sick of eating kale and cabbage and cauliflower so I'm quite happy to swap over to tomatoes and zucchinis and corn and the other things that I really really love to eat through the summer months. Um, and finally, uh, well not finally, but one other approach that you can take for these caterpillars is uh, using a spray. And so there's not that many commercial sprays that I use at all, but I will highlight this one because it's quite a powerful tool when you can't do any of these other strategies. And so this is a, a bioinsecticide and it's made from bacteria that poison caterpillars or, or kill them when they ingest it. And this uh, targets any caterpillar. So that includes caterpillars that you might like to turn into butterflies, uh, so be aware of that. But otherwise it's a specific poison for caterpillars that is safe um, for other beneficial insects, for children, for pets and for you as well. Uh, so feel free to look that one up later. It's called Diapel as a commercial name and um, this is the brand that is most uh, available to people in Australia. Right, I'm going to pause there and stop sharing. And when we come back, we're going to look at predators and specific predators for some of the things that we talked about, which are a much more fun and exciting way of tackling some of these pests. So I'm going to go back to Beck. Yeah. Um, see if there were any kind of pressing um, questions that a few people asked that we need to cover at this stage. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions, a couple about fruit flies, so perhaps we'll start there. Um, in terms of your fajoas, how widespread was the fruit fly larva? Was it most of the fruit or just a few? That's from Nin um, Ninja. <laughs> yeah, I would say probably um, a bit of a guess, but about 5% of the fruit were affected this year. I feel pretty confident that if we didn't do anything, it would be maybe 80% of the fruit next year. Um, that there are a lot of larvae that we intercepted. Uh, so yeah, really damaging pest. And so what's the solution? Just removing all of those fruit? Yep, trying to interrupt that breeding cycle. So we very carefully went through all the fruit, picked it up as soon as possible so that the larvae couldn't make it from the fruit into the ground. Um, we froze any infected fruit for about two days just to kill them off and then it should be fine to go into the compost. Um, you could also cook that fruit, as I said, um, but yeah, don't let it uh, escape <laughs> is the key. And um, netting probably is gonna be one of our best tools on the home garden scale. Um, and I mentioned also the protein baiting, but you might need to do that with your neighbors for effectiveness. Uh, there are other traps and things out there. This advice is coming from my friend Angelica Cameron, who's an entomologist who works with horticulture industries. And they're the two things that she said are most um, effective for home gardeners. And in terms of where they come from, um, Trish asked a question, could they come perhaps from seedlings, like from bunnings or? Um, um, yeah. Things that you buy from commercial nurseries really should be safe. And they're raised in greenhouses that have very strict biosecurity and they're raised in potting mediums that are usually um, quite sterile. So um, you should be fine with things bought from commercial nurseries and um, typically produce in supermarkets and, and markets generally uh, is gonna be okay. Unfortunately, this is an area where home gardeners are some of the worst um, spreaders of these sorts of diseases because we often share produce without inspecting it and we don't have that strict perfection standard that is demanded by the commercial system. So it's why I'm, I'm spending a, a real bit of time in here just encouraging people to be aware of that and make sure that you don't accidentally import or share something that uh, does have a pest like fruit fly. Mm. Um, quite a few questions about snails, so I might tackle a couple of them. Um, can you ever completely get rid of snails? No, and um, well, <laughs> most likely not. Of course, there are always exceptions. And that's coming back to this point about management rather than control. And the question is, would we ever want to get rid of snails completely? Um, and remembering that snails are an important source of food for lots of other animals like little skinks and lizards and birds. 
Uh, so it may not be desirable even for us to get rid of them, certainly not for the, the wider ecosystem. Mm. And so a couple of people have asked about pellets, but I take your point on um, pellets might be don't use them. Yeah. If you want to use a snail pellet, I didn't mention them because I haven't actually found them super effective compared to all the other things that I've told you about for snails. But if you are going to use a snail bait, there are some pellets which are based on iron as the active ingredient and some that have got some pretty nasty poisons in them. So do look for those iron-based baits that are likely to be a lot safer for you and pets and other wildlife as well. Thanks, Kat. Um, perhaps oh, there's just one question about caterpillars. The white oil spray, is that, can you use that for caterpillars? Deborah's yeah, probably asked. not. The, the oil sprays, as I said, act by suffocating and tends to work very well with those smaller soft-bodied pests. I don't know of anyone using it successfully on caterpillars, which is why I've talked about some of those other methods for you. Um, but I've saved the best one. We haven't covered the best method yet. So hang on till after the break for that one. Cool. Um, Karen's asked about putting snails that are alive in your green waste bin um, so they can break down green waste and continue to do so in landfill. Um, that's an interesting point, yeah, because as I said, all of these pests have got roles in the ecosystem. Slugs and snails are decomposers. So somewhere like a compost bin, unless you're breeding an empire of them that's going to march out from the compost bin and go back to your veggie patch, that's maybe a really appropriate spot for them. If you put them in the green waste bin, they'll um, probably have a good munch, but when that green waste bin gets emptied, it's going to be composted at temperatures between 60 and 70 degrees. So they will be killed off eventually if you pop them in there, um, most likely. Um, just back to fruit fly, because Liz has asked an important question. Do you need to report them or is there a way to report them anywhere? Oh, that's a great question. In Melbourne now, uh, you don't, uh, they're not asking you to report them anymore. Uh, that used to be the case, but look, unfortunately, they've just accepted that uh, we are going to have them in Melbourne and it's going to be a management thing rather than trying to jump on them and wipe them out. There are two protected horticultural zones in Victoria. Um, and one of them is the Yarra Valley and I'm just forgetting the other one. So they're areas with substantial orchards and other horticultural crops where it would be a really, really serious blow if it got in. So my understanding is that the um, Agriculture Victoria um, de Department is actually focused on protecting those areas, uh, but no longer protecting home gardeners in Melbourne. So yeah, sorry folks, it's, um, it's up to us now. Mm. Um, perhaps just one more. Lisa's asked about earwigs. Are they useful for anything? Um, sh you know, sure. Like um, what, what we're going for here, as I keep saying, is a balanced ecology and they're a big part of that ecosystem. Um, I don't know of any necessarily helpful roles that they play for us except just general breaking down of organic matter. Um, so yeah, there'll just be another general decomposer in the system, plus food for lots of other creatures that we know and love, like birds. Um, that's probably the main bulk of them. I mean, Rachel's asked about harlequin bugs, but perhaps cool. might be coming up, or maybe we'll get um, back to at the end. Maybe we'll, that's one that we can come back to yeah. at the end, just in the interest of getting through the next part of the session. So what I'd like to do now is give you all a chance to get up and stretch and refill covers and get maybe another. Um, blanket for your lap like me and um, we'll come back at let's say 12 past three it's a five minute break and if any of you do want to ask a question now during the break feel free to um, turn on your mic or pop that in the chat and I'll have to catch a few of those before we come back and start any more content do you need to grab your blanket cat um I yes <laughs> one second go do that we need you comfortable Okay. Can I ask you a question, Kat? Yes, go ahead. Uh, do the uh, do the dogs eat slugs or snails? Do the can you say that again? Do the what? Sorry. Do the dogs eat dog. slugs or smell? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I actually have no idea. Maybe we can ask anyone who's still listening to um, let us know. I, I don't have a dog and I never have. 
That would be um, that would be a lovely thing to train your dog to do if they could do it very delicately without affecting your other. <laughs> uh, I've got a question, if I can. Hi. Yeah, I'm listed as Colleen, but I'm actually Stephen. Um, <laughs> I put up a photograph. It's the uh, the new growth on a uh, flowering gum, mm. and they get quite shriveled up. And, uh, you know, it, it sort of kills off the new growth. And I'm unsure as to what's causing it. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, where did you say that picture was? It's in the uh, chat. If scroll up a little bit. And you oh, should fantastic. Yeah, it's listed as Photoshop, but it's actually uh, a JPEG. I'll just have a look at it. I'm going to say straight up that um, ornamental and Indigenous plants are not my area of expertise. So I'm not always able to help with these questions. I do have it up on the screen now. I think we should be able oh, to see there we it. go. Yep. Yeah. So, well, the first thing I can see there is definitely some spider webs. Um, and sometimes spiders will make a little waterproof house for themselves by curling leaves over and then binding them with web and then make their little garden around it to uh, catch the insects. Um, so I would be curious about just like opening one of those little curled leaves and seeing if you can find a creature inside okay um as a first step and i wonder if anyone looking at that wants to comment as well because it's not it's just not an area that i focus on a lot with my work i'm afraid yes that might be the extent of my help i'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> We've got an answer on the snails and the dogs. <laughs> Sharon's bred dogs for 30 years and has never seen one eat a snail or slug. There you go. Okay. There we go. And Thank a comment you. from Debbie about snails giving dogs lungworms. That's really important to know. Yes. Um, uh, snails and slugs and earwigs and, you know, lots of those creatures are vectors for different parasites that can transfer to poultry as well. So I did have... Um, I did have a debate about the pros and cons of feeding some of those things to my quail and decided it was just too big a advantage to um, block just on those grounds. Um, but that is something to know. There's, there's parasites and more parasites and we're going to meet some in just a minute. Can you hear me, Beth? Uh, very faintly. Hello. Hi. I had um, a question about eating uh, leaves of uh, plants that have been damaged somehow. For example, I have rocket um, and I can see some leaf miners uh, trails on there because it's stuff that you would eat raw and not cook. Mm. Do you see any issues with that? Um, I, I think probably people draw the line in different places here. Um, those sorts of things, though, usually there aren't implications for people eating them. So I'd probably be comfortable with that. Um, I'd prefer to just give the leaf a good wash. Um, you know, there are some diseases that you can get from slugs and snails, apparently. Um, yeah, or you could just cut off those parts, which is what I often do, and, okay. and just eat the rest of the leaf. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm so happy you're asking the question, though, because I, I guess I grew up in a household with a productive garden and a mum who would just happily eat everything with holes in it and cut bits off. But um, I've realised that that's actually not the norm these days, so it's an important a uh, thing to be thinking about and question to be asking. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we are at 3.12. Becky, happy for me to keep going again? Yeah, let's get back into it. All right, lovely. I know that was a very short stretch break, folks, but um, lots of exciting things that I want to show you and I don't want to have to cut them too short. Okay, so um, we are going to go into some predators next and... If, if everything that I talked about before sounds fiddly and like lots of work, you're going to really like the next option that I have for you. And um, at the risk of trying to share another video with you, given that videos have been a little bit problematic for Zoom today, I'm going to give it a go and just see what happens, see if I can get this up and running um, for you. Realising now that this would have been a great thing to do when we were having a break. Okay. All right, Beck, let me know if this is working. Yeah, we've got it. Okay, beautiful. So before I play it, um, some of you are going to have bad dreams tonight as a result of this. Nothing I can do about that. 
I hope you enjoy it. You might have to zoom out, Kat. It's like a, it looks like it's on a corner now. Our parasitized caterpillar has spent the last 12 days gorging itself. Yeah, going. Yeah. It that now that. is profoundly obese. But this is not all fat. The glomerata wasp larvae lie just under its skin. Each is the size of a grain of rice, but together they account for over a third of the caterpillar's weight. The larvae have not yet finished growing and need to keep their host alive. So although they feast on the caterpillar's blood, they have been careful not to touch a single one of its vital organs. This uneasy truce will not last. Within days, the larvae are fully matured. Suddenly, they begin to stir into action. For the past two weeks, this surrogate womb has protected them, but now they no longer need it. To complete the next stage of their life cycle, they must break out. The caterpillar's thick skin should be a solid barrier to the parasitic wasp larvae. But as their bodies have grown, they have developed tiny saw-like teeth. These jagged jaws. I think, yeah, the screen's frozen, I think, Kat. Is okay, that... sorry, let me see if I can persuade it. These jagged yeah, better jaws now. are for one job only. Cutting their way out. Stroke by stroke, the larvae slice through the tough layers of skin. At the same time, they release chemicals that paralyze the caterpillar. Mm -hmm. As the larvae break through, there is nothing it can do. Free at last, the larvae enter a new phase of development. They swiftly spin silken cocoons. These will provide the perfect environment for their final transformation. But ironically, one of the greatest dangers the larvae will face is being themselves impregnated by other species of parasitic wasp. Incredibly, the wounded caterpillar helps them out. You should. I know it's frozen again, I'm just gonna. Usually, a caterpillar would spin a silken blanket to make its own cocoon. But the parasitized caterpillar spins his blanket on top of the wasp cocoons, giving them an extra layer of protection. Scientists believe the same wasp virus that infected it weeks before has now invaded the caterpillar's brain and caused this bizarre corruption of its normal behavior. Amazingly, the caterpillar's natural aggression is now also exploited by the wasp virus. The caterpillar becomes a bodyguard, actively protecting the cocoons from other parasites. It will watch over them unceasingly until it eventually starves to death.
Oh, poor caterpillar. <laughs> Anyone feeling sorry for that caterpillar out there? It's a very, very dangerous place to be a caterpillar. Uh, or an aphid in the garden when there are these sorts of predators around. Let's meet a few of them and um, talk about how we can encourage them. Firstly, what is a parasitic wasp? Uh, most of us are a um, bit hesitant about the word wasp, but this is a family that includes lots and lots of different species. Parasitic wasps are not interested in humans. They can't bite us, they can't sting us or hurt us. And so, uh, although they look a little bit scary, don't worry about them. And I've just pulled up this big image for you here to just show you that egg laying stick, um, the ovipositor, which comes out of their abdomen. And that is a pretty good sign that it's a parasitic wasp that you're looking at, as well as just the general wasp-like shape and waist and appearance. So I you know, barely know any of the proper names for these insects, but I can spot them now, at least some of the larger ones, when they show up in the garden. Uh, what, what you see a lot more of is the results of their work. And in this photograph here, I've found three different um, caterpillars in different forms and in many ways this is like the pathways that the caterpillar could take so when it looks like this normal caterpillar up here at the top we don't know at this stage whether or not it's been infected by those eggs and the parasitic wasp virus so immediately for me that's quite interesting and it um, brings into question whether I should be squashing it given that it actually may be a carrier for the parasites that are about to help out with some of the other ones that I haven't found yet. I don't know, we'll have to make that decision. Now, if it hasn't been infected, this is what should happen to a caterpillar. We should have it forming a little uh, cocoon and um, going into that pupil form inside before it then emerges as a moth or a butterfly. So if you see that, um, we know for sure that it's not infected and that would be a good one to maybe get rid of. Uh, on the other hand, if you see it go down uh, this trajectory over here, um, uh, that is actually what you saw in the video. So that caterpillar is protecting that egg sac of the parasitic wasp larvae. And um, if they hatch, then you'll see little holes. So you can actually tell whether those eggs have um, been released into the world or not. Over here, there's another version of the caterpillar. And this time it's a different type of parasitic wasp that doesn't keep the caterpillar alive, it swells it up and it becomes this uh, womb for the larvae and the caterpillar kind of gets um, mummified and preserved in that process. It's quite hideous. And, um, oh, here we go. There's some photographs of what hatches out. So these yellow eggs here, you get these tiny, tiny little parasitic wasps. And um, from this big, fat, uh, swollen caterpillar, uh, you get even tinier creatures hatching out. So you, you probably won't see these in the garden, let's be honest. They're really, really small. Um, but you can start to look out for signs that caterpillars have been parasitised. And um, when you get your eye in and when you do the, the work to encourage them, you'll start to see these really regularly and it's quite exciting. Uh, it's not just caterpillars, though, that this works for. In fact, um, the more I look, the more I realise most of our garden pests do have parasitoids that can come into play. And what you might be able to see here, if you've got good eyesight, is an aphid that's also looking quite swollen and coppery. And um, the aphid has been infected again um, by a parasitic wasp. So this is an incredible photo of those eggs being injected into it. And now imagine how small that parasitic wasp is compared to the aphid. It's really, really tiny, only a couple of mil. And this is what happens to those poor old aphids. Again, like that other swollen caterpillar, they become this mummified uh, womb and then these larvae hatch out of its abdomen when the time comes. And the good news is that you can spot these in your garden reasonably easily. As long as you've got average eyesight, you'll be able to see these swollen, coppery-coloured aphids now. And here's a leaf I turned over on one of my capsicums and you can just see how many of them there are. So I guess as a rule of thumb, if I can see aphids, but when I examine the leaf, I can see maybe three or four of these parasitized aphids, then I don't usually do too much else uh, because there's a good chance that some of these um, parasitic wasps are in play and going to manage that population for me.
over time. Um, so I've got some other predators that I wanted to introduce you to as well. And these are some of the, the things I love to discover in the garden. They're not parasitic in the same way as those wasps, uh, but they do eat a lot of those particularly soft body pests like the um, aphids and the whitefly and scale and so on. This is a lacewing here and you kind of think that they're a moth. Some of them look a lot like moths when they fly particularly, uh, but they're not. And they lay these eggs, some of them lay eggs on fine stems. And I've been told that they do that because the larvae when they hatch out are so aggressive that they might actually eat their brothers and sisters if they didn't have some uh, distancing in place. And um, they become these curious little um, larvae that wander around. Um, I did have a video, but I'm just very hesitant to try and show you more videos, unfortunately. Uh, they bumble around on the leaf and whenever they find an aphid, they stop and they suck the guts out of that aphid like it's a little green smoothie. And then they take the aphid's body and they stick it on their back as camouflage. So you see them and they're these tiny little bumbling trash heaps that just wander around through your garden. Uh, they're quite actually intriguing and amazing to watch. So lace things we want lots of in the garden. We also want a lot of hoverflies. And this is one you probably have seen if you've been paying attention. They're very common. They um, make a sort of buzzing sound like a mosquito and they tend to hover in place often around flowers and um, obviously the veggies where some of their favorite food is. And if you like, they're the little Apache helicopters of your garden defense system. And you can see them just, just scanning all the time for where to, where to lay their eggs. And their eggs will actually turn into these larvae. So the adults don't eat any of your pests, but the larvae, again, like to suck the guts out of aphids. Everything wants to suck the guts out of aphids, believe me. So hoverflies are a great thing and it's lovely to have more of them in the garden. So how do we encourage more of these small predatory insects? And the strategy really comes down to providing um, bed and breakfast, we could say. We're gonna look at the breakfast first. So here's a picture of a hoverfly on a daisy flower. And daisies are one of the great family groups to include in your gardens. And um, we'll look at a few other examples. Uh, we have native daisies. So it's a lovely place to include um, indigenous plants that also have some other functional roles for you in the garden. Now this one's called a brachycomb daisy. Uh, it's quite long flowering and obviously quite tough. Uh, so it's a lovely reason to include them. And um, we've got some other flowering types as well, which are very helpful. And this is the umbel flower shape, or you can think of it as like umbrella. <laughs> so all these little umbrella shaped flowers are excellent. And the other one that I have a picture of here is alyssum, uh, which is a very, very common plant, easily found in any nursery. Also edible, uh, which I discovered, and that's great news. You can pop it in salads, you can sprinkle them on desserts. It's related to, you know, it's in the brassica family, so it has a little mustardy flavour, which is nice. And um, the common thread that runs through all of these types of plants is that these flowers are very, very small. And the reason I've got this particular photo to show you is I want you to zoom in on that uh, little tongue that the, um, the hoverfly has or proboscis or whatever it's officially called. And just think about how small that tongue is. So small insects need very small nectar cups, otherwise they just can't reach them. Uh, bees, if you've watched them, have got this incredibly long tongue and they can get down into the bottom of much larger flowers. But for these little creatures, we must have lots and lots of small flowers. So the good news is that you don't even really need to know the names of these plants. If they've got a small flower, and particularly if they're from one of these groups like daisies or umbels, then you can be pretty sure that that's a helpful plant for you to have in your garden. The other trick here is that we don't want to take away breakfast for parts of the year, and particularly important parts of the year like spring when some of these pests are starting to build up numbers. So we're looking for a range, a nice diversity of these flowers for as much of the year as you can manage. Which means if you notice there's a gap, as I do sometimes, 
walk around the neighborhood and see if you can spot some plants that are flowering at the right time, ask if you can take a cutting or get some seed um, or identify them so you can go and get it from somewhere else. Um, and that's really the very simple but um, really effective technique for bringing these insects into your garden. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of others and then come back to some of the habitat because it relates to some of these other uh, predators as well. So before we get on to that, I wanted to talk about um, spiders. <laughs> oh, and sorry, I will just pause for a minute. Dandelions, uh, yes, I think so, Nadine. And parsley absolutely is an umbel flower. And um, spiders, okay, so other important predators in your garden. I know spiders have a really bad reputation, but I'm gonna fight for them a bit here because there's only one or two types that are in any way dangerous to people in Victoria. And if you're wearing gardening gloves when you're lifting pots and that sort of thing, you're probably not gonna have any trouble with them. So um, there's an amazing array of spiders out in my garden. I'm sure there are in yours. The one on the left-hand side is a wolf spider that we found once. And that hairy stuff on his back actually moves. It's all its babies. So it's like a school bus and it just wanders around just dropping kids off all over the garden when it's hatching. And that's, that's how it um, propagates itself. And when I was putting this session together a couple of years ago, um, uh, someone leaned over my shoulder and said, does that, does that spider remind you of someone? I don't know if you can see that screen. <laughs> but I just got to have a little crack in there. <laughs> anyway, amazing spiders, really intriguing, beautiful to observe. They catch um, caterpillars, they catch aphids, they also catch bees, they catch anything that there's a lot of in your garden. So what they do is balance out the ecosystem and just cut the peaks off anything that's getting a little bit too out of control. Also, just imagine for a minute that you're an aphid and you have to navigate your way through some of that spider web on the right hand side. Imagine what it's like trying to find your way to a cabbage when there's spider webs everywhere in your way. Super intimidating. So spiders and spider webs are helpful to us. And if you can bear to let them stay and even breed, then um, you're putting yourself in a better position. All right, now, now to habitat, and this includes spiders, of course, which is why I've popped it here. Some of you will have come across insect hotels and maybe even made one yourself. And um, I think they're a great thing. And bee hotels, they're hotels for lots and lots of different creatures. And the idea is that we just get a few different types of materials, um, hollow stems from things like fennel or parsley are really good bits of wood with holes of different sizes and depths drilled into them. You can do clay with bits of hole, um, hole poked in, pine cones, lots and lots of different materials. So we're going for diversity here to attract the maximum range of creatures into the garden. So insect hotels are great, but I can tell you that these insects are not fussy. And the thing that they really want is just a great range of little nooks and crannies, lots of different materials and textures, and somewhere that's not disturbed. And so that might be the key with insect hotels. If you're sweeping up and mowing lawns and just tidying up all the time, these creatures that need to overwinter are gonna have a really hard time um, propagating or, or, or um, breeding up and coming through next season. So I, I don't have a specific insect hotel, uh, but I see these insects breeding up everywhere. And I know when I'm tidying up, to leave a few areas that are not um, managed uh, too much to interfere with them. Uh, I couldn't resist showing you this um, photo of a praying mantis down below. Uh, it's laying an egg sac. It's called an, an uthica, and it turns brown when it's hardened off, which is the picture on the bottom right hand side. And they are not fussy. They're all over the grapevine. I found one on a sliding screen door the other day. I found lacewing eggs on my bicycle wheel and on my neighbor's roller door. <laughs> so these creatures will stay, but just try not to um, disturb all parts of your garden all the time. Okay, I'm cracking along a little bit and we're gonna move up the scale a little bit and start looking at some of the larger pests that you might have encountered. Um, I wonder if anyone out there has got a possum problem like we used to have. And um, if you don't know, that's the kind of damage that we're looking at for a possum. 
often starting close to fence lines and often starting at the top of the tree. Although as we discovered, the possums can quite comfortably move down the tree along the ground and right into your veggie patch if they're keen enough. One of the early tricks and techniques, if you've got space, is maybe not putting fruit trees all the way along a fence line because that is like a super highway for these possums and it is quite an easy way for them to get into the trees and start accessing the food. Uh, that's not always a, an option and it certainly wasn't an option for us in a smaller garden. So I'm gonna show you some other techniques as well. Our possum is called Sally, by the way. We know Sally quite well, the brush tail that visits us every night. <laughs> and I tolerate um, an amount of damage on the avocado and for joas out the front of our house because uh, they need to eat too. And as I said before, I'm still getting a crop, so that's okay. Um, but we actually have one of the most severe possum problems I've ever encountered in this particular block. And um, for many of our fruit trees, they will have the bark ripped off them in winter. Uh, fruit, um, it doesn't even get to the fruit stage. They eat the leaves, they eat the buds, uh, they break branches. Uh, just incredible. So we joke a little bit that we're in the good food guide for possums here and we had to take some pretty serious evasive action at the back to make sure that we were still able to grow food. Um, I can see Mint Ninja says that possums are freaking ninjas and yeah they totally are. <laughs> Did you know the word possum in Latin apparently means I am capable of? Now, I don't know if there's a connection there but yeah seriously possums they incredible and very um, adaptable, flexible uh, little, um, I should say pests, but I'll say creatures because they're also wonderful and we want to have them around. Now let's look at some methods that we can use to exclude possums. And I feel like I should say at this point, just because it often comes up, uh, it is illegal for you to trap a possum in Victoria unless they're inside your house and they must be released I think on the same property or at least within 50 metres from where you've um, caught them in the trap. Um, so they are native animals and we share our environment with them. Uh, so it's a case of kind of learning to live with them a little bit, but then trying to protect the things that matter to us the most. So one of the first things that people usually try is um, netting and it can be effective. Uh, our possums, by the way, learnt how to rip through netting, so it's not a foolproof strategy. Um, but I need to draw your attention to the netting in the top left-hand corner here and just highlight that garden nets are really serious threats to some wildlife. And you, frankly, you cannot unsee some of the photos of um, entangled bats and lizards and birds and snakes. Um, it's really, really horrible stuff. Uh, so I'm going to encourage you to always get a net that uh, won't allow a finger to poke through it. And um, if you can put a finger through your net, then it is a danger to wildlife and really seriously think about replacing it if you've already got it. I don't actually think they're allowed to sell them anymore. Um, so hopefully you won't be offered those when you show up to a nursery or hardware store anymore. If you see them, maybe um, politely tell the shop owner um, about that issue. So netting can work, but what we do want is these nice fine nets in the bottom left hand corner and we want them secured in a way where the netting is fairly taut and creatures can't work their way up into the net and get stuck. Because even if they don't die from, you know, being strangled, they can die from stress and they can die from dehydration as well. And none of us wants to be responsible for, for that kind of damage. And so we want nice safe nets and um, that's the way that we kind of try and install them. Uh, these pictures, by the way, are from a site called Wildlife Friendly Fencing, which you might want to check out. And they've got some more research and uh, suggestions on there for you as well. And we have some other options besides netting though. And anyone who's walked through gardens in Melbourne will have seen these big smooth um, barriers that they pop around large trees. So a possum, of course, needs to get up into a tree somehow. And um, sometimes it can just walk across from a fence top. But if it has to go across the ground, sometimes you can use a slippery barrier on a tree or even on a fence to stop them from climbing up. We can, of course, do a full uh, netted or wire mesh enclosure, which is the option you can see on the right hand side. And they're really effective. And if you've got pests like birds um, or other wildlife, 
just having a defendable area for some of your treasured crops can be a really good use of your time and solve a lot of other issues down the track. If you don't have things coming in from overhead, then another great option for you is this thing called a floppy fence. And this is a diagram that my dear friend Hannah from Good Life Permaculture in Tassie has drawn. And she's done a ridiculously good blog post on how to build a floppy fence. So if you head over to her website, goodlifepermaculture.com.au, she can walk you through the ways of putting them together. The basic concept though, is that you create a fence with a floppy loose top so that anything that tries to climb it kind of fails when they get to that overhang and can't make it across to the other side. Um, Michelle, the website is Wildlife Friendly Fencing. And um, I just try typing that, but I'm sure you can Google it or search for it as well. Oh, there we go, Andriana, thank you. <laughs> All right, so physical barriers are, are often the best approach for things like birds and possums. The key is just observing how they move, where they come from, how they like to um, move around your garden, and then designing something, um, experimenting until you find it. I want to mention an, uh, another one as well, and this is the one that we settled on for our possum problem because those other ones for various reasons were just not real options in our context. So what we've done for possums at the plumbery where I live is use a commercial product called a ping string, which is a domestic, very low voltage, very safe electric fence. And this is sold to keep people's cats and dogs inside and to keep possums out of gardens. And um, this has been really 100% infective since we installed it, with the exception of one cheeky cat that has been um, finding ways to jump over it <laughs> recently. But mostly it works as an animal training device. So they'll touch it and then they'll remember not to touch it again. Uh, my neighbour's kids sometimes bring their friends down the alley and dare each other to touch it for, um, <laughs> for giggles, which is pretty funny for us inside the fence. So it won't hurt anything, but it will be a very serious deterrent. And um, this is where we had to settle after trying a lot of those other options, um, which um, weren't effective. All right, I'm gonna talk about rodents a little bit as well. And it, it's a topic that gardeners often don't want to talk about in my experience, because nobody wants to admit that their veggie patch is a draw card for rodents in the neighborhood. But the very sad thing is that rats and mice eat basically the same foods as humans. And to some extent, you know, you can keep them out of your house, but it's much harder to keep them out of your veggie bed. And we have uh, at times had uh, rats just like gnawing away at beetroot as it's growing in the bed, which is horrible <laughs> and gross. So we need a solution for that. Um, so we have tried pretty much every form of snap trap on the market. I consider us like an R&D uh, kind of thing over here. So um, for your benefit, we've tried them almost all. And unfortunately, they work to some extent with mice, but ro rats are really clever and rats seem to learn very quickly uh, what to avoid. Snap traps are what the RSPCA recommend, by the way, as being um, the kindest option if you need to remove rodents from your system. And we have not gotten down the route of poison here because poison, uh, as well as being just a horrible way for a creature to die, uh, also can end up transferring up the food chain to other animals. Um, so uh, what we have done here is, um, is settle on having a predator on duty. And um, so this is my cat, Carbonell. He's just sitting down here to my right. And the reason I feel comfortable with this is um, that we have that electric fence and although you know we're doing a little bit of maneuvering at the moment because he's learnt a way to jump over it when it's on a flat surface uh, more or less um, the cat stays inside the fence and uh, he can go out on patrol within our food producing area uh, and then possums are also controlled and uh, the rodents are deterred. So this is one of those uh, points of debate where I'm sure everyone's got their own opinion out there and they're all um, really valid. Pets can have jobs, but we also need to make sure that wildlife is safe. 
Uh, so this cat will very quickly become an indoor cat if he keeps um, working out how to jump over the fence. And it's only something I feel comfortable doing because he's contained within this area. But if you've got a cat or if you've got a dog, why not see if you can integrate them into your food producing system so that they can play a helpful role. And they don't even need to be very good <laughs> at um, going after rats and mice. They just need to be interested. And my experience has been this is like easily the most sustainable long-term way of controlling rodents uh, in your system. So let me know what you think of that in the chat window. I wonder if anyone else has got other pets that they've managed to integrate. And I'm going to move along. I wanted to mention another thing that I've learned over the last few years is you'll never be able to do just one thing in your garden. So by the way, if you get rid of rats, you will have more snails <laughs> uh, because they control snails for you. So if you control the rats, then you leave that niche open. And um, there's a great saying that nature abhors a vacuum. So as soon as you take away the influence of one creature, you're going to create a niche for another one that will be filled. So we're tinkering all the time here. And sometimes it's a question of which critter would you rather do the management on? Uh, so there you go. All right, coming down to the, the last few things here. And of course, I just need to mention birds. We've already talked about netting and um, some of the you know, other things you might do. I did want to mention, of course, that you have a choice of just netting the part of the crop that they go for. So if getting a big net and putting it over your whole fruit tree is a bit too hard, you could perhaps put some little individual bags around the fruit. Um, they sell them, but you could also repurpose some bags. It's great if they've got some airflow and maybe still some sun, and so you can see what's happening inside the bag as well. Uh, birds, of course, also sometimes are a problem scratching around in your mulch looking for worms. And um, certainly in our garden where there's a lot of worms, we can have birds coming in, even with the cats um, trying to keep an eye out for them. And so I've got a pretty nice collection of random bits of wire mesh that I've pulled out of skips. This is an old supermarket shelf that you can see here. And I use this to just protect those little seedlings while they're getting established. And it'll come off as soon as they start to um, uh, grow too much better. There are some other birds that might be really excited about your veggies, but might also help you out a lot as well. And uh, have a look at these badass chickens on the left-hand side here. They, there's nothing they would like more than to help you out with your pest management problems. So if you can work out a way to integrate poultry into your food garden, sometimes you'll do a lot less work. But the key here is that many of these animals, particularly chickens, will also like to eat your salad greens. So one of the common techniques that people use for integrating chickens is something called a chook tractor, uh, where you have a movable cage that gets rotated around your garden after you've finished cropping it. And so the chickens can come in, clean up any last scraggly vegetables, uh, scratch around looking for those insects for you. While they're there, they're going to do a few poos, which is fantastic. So they're fertilizing as well. As uh, so it's a really, really elegant system if it works in your setup. And uh, Jessamy is giving me a few thumbs up. And Jessamy just again is running an excellent session tomorrow on keeping chooks. And I'm, I'm sure she can go into a little bit more detail on some of those setups as well. But it's not just chooks, right? There's also ducks, um, some of which are really renowned snail hunters. And um, even guinea fowl, I've got a slightly blurry picture of guinea fowl in the bottom right hand corner, this slightly mysterious um, exotic bird. And the garden where I took that photo, the um, guy whose place it was said he can't find any slaters or earwigs anymore in his whole garden. <laughs> and he said that the guinea fowl just delicately pick around all of his seedlings. So I don't know if that's totally always the case. Um, but yeah, don't be restricted to just chickens. And of course, we use quail at the plumbery as well. So they're a smaller bird for smaller spaces. Okay, finally, I, I know I haven't talked a lot about diseases yet. And um, of course, they're a thing. Lots of the other preventative techniques that we've talked about so far will also help with diseases. But I thought that I would mention two of the most common ones um, before we finish up for people who are getting started and um, it's just so you're aware of them when they pop up. 
The one on the right hand, oh, so let's start with the left hand side. The left hand side one is an example of peach leaf curl. And I actually think it's quite pretty when I take a step back from it. Are these um, almost fluorescent colours that appear on the leaves? Uh, but this um, disease can do pretty serious damage to your peach and nectarine crops. And it's a bit less common in other stone fruit, um, but it can pop up in them as well. And again, the first thing I'm thinking when I see a tree that's heavily infested is what's going on in that soil and is this tree stressed? Because stress is always going to exacerbate these sorts of problems when they crop up. So it would be a sign for me to just make sure that my peach tree is getting enough compost and mulch and water and has enough um, sun and all, all the things that a peach tree needs to be happy. Uh, once I've checked that, um, I'll be maybe trying a quick fix uh, to, to get this under control. And the quick fix for this one is a copper spray, uh, which gets sold at any nursery. And um, it's, it's kind of borderline organic because copper can build up in your soil in an unhelpful way. Uh, but this is how, you know, all the, those organic um, uh, peaches and things come to be. Commercial orchards will often spray maybe six times, uh, I'm told, in the winter. In the home garden, you probably only need one or maybe two maximum. But you, you have to spray this in the winter. So when the buds have burst on your tree, it's too late and you've got to wait till next year. Uh, so that, that's the treatment strategy for that one. And then the one on the right hand side is um, powdery mildew, which uh, shows up all the time in zucchinis and cucumbers and pumpkins and all the crops in that family. Uh, the powdery mildew is, as far as I can tell, a pretty natural end of life cycle for those plants. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a season without it coming eventually. But the question is, does it come early when you're still hungry for those zucchinis or does it come late in the year when you're kind of sick of zucchinis and you're happy to get them out of the way anyway? If it comes early, again, of course, I look at the plant and see if it's stressed, but you can be a bit unlucky or perhaps it's been a, a really um, bad year for it. So with fungal diseases, the things that exacerbate fungus are, are lots of humidity and poor airflow and sunlight. So then the way that we might manage it is to uh, make sure that we're not watering on the leaves of the plant um, or even at night when that moisture might hang around a bit longer. We try and do early morning waterings and water the soil, not the leaf. We probably should also remove any of those leaves that start to show little dots that are the first sign of infection and try and encourage lots of light and airflow into the plant. If you watch it closely, you'll see that the leaves where it shows up first are often the ones that aren't getting enough airflow. They're close to the ground or they're folded over. So just by pruning the plant a little bit to let some of that light and airflow flow through, you can um, sometimes bring it under control. Uh, Jan has asked, have you used a milk spray? And yes, Jan, I was just about to talk about this. This is another one that has really good evidence behind it. And it's used for powdery mildew, a slightly different variety in um, vineyards. And so this is a milk spray that's maybe like one part milk to nine or 10 parts water. So quite diluted milk. You spray it, apparently it's very important to spray it on sunny days because the sun converts some of the milk into an acid and that acid is what attacks the fungus. So I have gone out there with some diluted milk if um, the problem is uh, seeming to not be controlled by those other steps. Um, yeah, so there's, there's just some quick things on diseases. The other thing that I've done a bit of at home is looking for varieties that are more resistant. So I thought, and I, I have decided to put in a nectarine, but I thought hard about whether I really wanted a nectarine because they do often need this kind of finicky treatment. Um, if you're quite happy with plums or apricots, maybe just put in a plumber and apricot and then you never have to worry about this stuff, right? The little fruit that you can see on the screen here is a cucumelon. And this is a type of cucumber, very miniature small one, that never gets powdery mildew. So I'm not saying you should all grow cucumelons. I'm just using it as an example to say that there are often resistant varieties. And if you've got a real problem with one crop, then you can see if there's a similar crop or another variety of that crop that might be a bit more resistant to your pest or disease. 
All right, now coming right down to the end now. So uh, what I've done hopefully is go through some common things and along the way pulled out uh, the kind of lessons and different options that you've got, uh, different types of solutions that you could look for as examples that you might then be able to apply to other circumstances. So uh, finalising this all, wrapping it up at the end, what I wanted to do is give you a sense for where I start and um, what I progress to if that doesn't work. So this is about having a longer term and more strategic approach uh, to these pest problems. So the foundation, as I've hopefully hinted enough about as we've gone through, is starting with healthy soil and starting with a design where your plants have the best chance of being healthy. Um, I haven't covered any of that really today. So if you've missed the other sessions that we've run through this series, I'd really encourage you to get the link and particularly have a look at that soil session. Um, also, when we're designing our garden, we're trying to create that balanced ecosystem by bringing in a lot of those predators that are going to control pests for us. And there's heaps more out there. We haven't really talked much about bringing in small insect eating birds, for example, and where do they like to live like prickly small prickly shrubs can we put them in our garden so whatever you're having problems with look at what eats it and see if you can design something that will bring that into your system once i've done that then um, it comes back to that question of acceptance so are you getting a crop is it okay having a bit of damage does what's going on justify taking any more steps um, my dear friend adam um, who wrote an excellent book on edible weeds likes to say, you weed in your mind first. <laughs> and I, I actually love that expression. So in this case, I could say, we decide what is a pest in our mind first um, before we go out and, and take action. So acceptance is a real thing and doing nothing might be a smart, very legitimate pest management approach. If we do decide that we've got to intervene, then the first a uh, call for me is something really simple like hand picking a pest, pulling that cabbage off the broccoli, uh, for example, or squashing that snail that I come across on my little nighttime patrol. And I've walked you through just examples of other things that you might try like netting or homemade traps and sprays and so on. And then finally, as you've probably guessed, bought in products and um, those commercial organic sprays are the things that I do least and do last. So uh, hopefully um, that gives you some ideas of how to plan out your approach for whatever's ailing you in your garden. And hopefully it's an approach that will save you time in the long run um, and also stop you just immediately reaching for a commercial spray, um, which um, may or may not make sense in the context of what's actually going on for you. Okay, so finishing up, I, I wanted to give you two books um, if this has really um, been interesting and you, you'd like to follow up in more detail. The book on the left is a brilliant reference book with lots and lots of photographs and just excellent information. It's like a reference book to look things up. The book on the right is a lovely, uh, really well articulated um, approach to pest management. Pretty similar stuff to what I've talked about today, um, just walking you through how you might plan out an approach. Um, they're both good. The one on the right does not have photographs. It just has line drawings, which unfortunately is um, a bit of a bummer because <laughs> photographs are so helpful. But yeah, these are the books that I would strongly recommend if you'd like to um, go further. And the other one I wanted to mention is uh, a lot of what I've talked about comes under the banner of Integrated Pest Management or IPM. And um, if you're interested, there's a lot of resources for farmers out there on how to do integrated pest management strategies. Some of it's a bit more technical than a home gardener needs, but you might um, enjoy having a read of some of those resources as well. So that's been a bit of a whirlwind. Um, I thought I'd put in some actual healthy veggies at the end just to prove to you that not everything in my garden is infested with pests. And um, I, I want to thank you for joining us today. And also thanks Stonington and the other councils for just giving me the opportunity to do some more in-depth teaching with you over the last few weeks. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Beck, and I'm guessing that Beck's going to say some official words and then we're going to stick around for any questions that you might like to follow up with. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, yeah, once again, another awesome session um, jam-packed with so much information. And, um, yeah, so much useful information, I'm sure. So everyone's got a lot out of it. Um, and I think, yeah, this session... Oh, uh, sorry, I thought I just lost you, but I definitely didn't. Um, this session and I think all of the ones we've um, run together... I think your curiosity and the fun that you have throughout the whole process and yeah, enjoying that process in the journey of gardening is, um, is quite infectious. So yeah, I, I love um, your openness and sharing all of that with us. Um, I do like to wrap up these webinars by making a request of everyone. And I'm sure you're definitely going to be doing this anyway, but um, I just like you to have a quick think about um, something that you've learned today that was really useful and that you're going to um, apply or try out in your garden in the next week. Um, so maybe it's your yeah, nighttime expedition. Uh, maybe it's a new way to identify um, pests or, or plants that you've got in your garden or weeds. Um, you know, maybe it's trialing a new white oil or perhaps just changing your interve intervention standards. Um, so yeah, just have a think and you can share it in the chat if you like, or share it with the person next to you um, and yeah, get active. Uh, tomorrow, I just wanted to highlight again, tomorrow is our last webinar um, in this series and it's with the lovely Jessamy Miller um, on keeping happy, healthy backyard chooks. So please come along to that if that's something that you're interested in. Um, I will share recordings from this session and also all of our sessions with Kat after this webinar. I'll send an email and you'll get all of that information. Um, I'll just note if you can't attend the Chook session tomorrow, but you're interested in information, please um, register and you'll receive a copy of the recording. I did really quickly want to um, mention our Backyard Biodiversity Blitz, which we're currently right in the middle of in Sonnington. We're running it all of June and it's, it's basically we're asking our community to um, help us build a picture of biodiversity in Sonnington and um, see what species we've got um, living all around us. And we're doing it through the app iNaturalist, which we mentioned, um, a couple of people mentioned in the chat, which is a really cool app, really easy to use for identification. So you, the minimum, um, you just take photos of whatever you've got in your garden um, and people, it's kind of crowdsourcing um, that identification. So it's a really cool tool and I'd love for you to get involved in the Blitz and show us what's growing in your garden. I will send a survey after this uh, webinar. So um, please help us improve our webinars and our events by filling out that survey. Um, and yeah, just wanted to say a massive, massive thanks to Kat uh, for this we webinar today, but also the series. Um, it's been so popular. As I said, we've been blown away by the attendance. We've had, I think, 500, oh, actually now I think it's been six or 700 people come along just to these sessions with Kat. Um, and the recordings have been watched over 700 times, which is pretty incredible. So um, yeah, I think Kat's gone viral and um, spreading permaculture far and wide all across Australia. Um, yeah, massive thanks to Kat and thanks also to Andriana working way behind the scenes to help um, answer your questions. And thank you to all of you guys for joining and wishing you all the best out there in the garden and hope to see you at another um, environmental kind of Stonington's event soon. So that's my official wrap up. <laughs> um, now we've got some, we've, we'll hang on the line for some questions for anyone who um, still has burning questions. and. We do have a whole heap um, going in the background, but I think what we'll do, because we've had a bunch of people drop off. So um, if you've got a question that hasn't been answered, could you please just pop it in the chat again and we'll address it that way. Thanks, Beck. I'm very curious to know how you feel about that first picture of the cabbage that I put up at the start and whether I've complicated your approach in any way. <laughs> Oh, Angela, your oh, harlequin bugs. Yes. Um, I've got to say, it's actually not something that I've had to deal with here. So I don't have a really detailed answer for you. And I wonder if there's other people out there who have that could talk about their approaches in the chat window. Um, usually, if there's a lot of bugs like that, a harlequin's the ones that drop off the leaf when you disturb them. So I think, it, yeah, if they're, if they're those ones, I often put a bucket underneath and I'll just kind of rustle them into a bucket and then go and feed them to the quail. 
Um, but maybe there's some more sophisticated responses that people have out there. Um, Greg's just asked about the webinars and um, we will be hosting them at the moment, they're just recording links, but I'll be hosting them on the Stonington website and they'll be available um, indefinitely. So um, just maybe perhaps in July, search our Stonington website and you should be able to find them under our sustainable gardening information. All right. Andrea, and I'm just letting you know, we're not using the um, Google Doc anymore. We can um, just go straight to the chat. So, um, <laughs> oh, diatom, I don't know how you say it. Um, yeah, that's a product that you can buy. And the theory about it that gets promoted is that it um, has, on a microscopic level, really sharp um, edges and it pierces the exoskeletons of bugs and then they dehydrate and dry out. And um, I, I just haven't seen any like super convincing evidence for that. I know that it's used sometimes by seed companies to maybe protect seeds. Um, yeah, it's certainly not something I've, I've done a lot of experiment, experimenting with. So I, I'm not sure if I can have an opinion on that one, but I um, haven't really seen like a lot of real evidence for it yet. What about brown rot in Quince's cat? Oh, yeah. Um, Wars and advice from Lindy. Yeah, that's one where I'd be looking up a book because I haven't experienced it personally. So again, if anyone's got tips on that, pop them in the chat window. Um, it's a question, the first thing I'd be asking is, is it a disease or is it a pest? So do we know that it's um, a disease or maybe there's some coddling moths that are causing that rot in the fruit? So we want to be like a bit more specific about what the problem is there. And then I'd go looking at um, this one here, like I talked about before, um, for a, a, some guidance on the approach. Um, what about, do you know flatworms like blue planarian, are they carnivorous and do they eat snails and slugs? Yeah, um, I, I'm amazed that you've brought them up because not many people know about them. If you pull a, a big rock, off and um, roll it over, you'll often find these uh, almost um, like ridiculously coloured flat worms in there. I've got some that are uh, sort of an apricot orange colour and I've got some that are black with a really alarming yellow stripe down the side of them. And um, it took me a while to work out what they were. And I, I think they're planarians, as you say. The research I did on them a long time ago said that they were carnivorous and they do sometimes eat worms but I've never heard of them eating snail although that's not out of the question and um, they freak me out a little bit they're very sticky and um, I, they give me the heebie-jeebies a little bit but one of my um, mentors said to me isn't it just a sign of really good diversity in your garden cat so <laughs> I try and look at them as a diversity thing and um, certainly we've got a load of slugs and snails and got a load of worms so they're not really having a major impact on populations either way. Mm. Um, Terry's asked about ants, lots of ants around veggie seedlings. Are they okay or just happy ants? <laughs> or um, yeah, look, ants are one of those creatures that they do great things for us in the garden and they also do some unhelpful things like protecting aphids. One of the things they do is take leaf litter and bury it down in the soil and make beautiful channels through the soil that then allow oxygen and water and roots and so on to get nice down deep. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're only bad if they're obviously causing an issue for you. So I wouldn't necessarily worry if they were around my seedling bench. Um, yeah, well, that's all I'll say on that. Cool. And um, the last one so far is Tanglefoot. Will it help with coddling moth? Uh, it might, Angela, because um, my understanding of coddling moth is that they spend their pupil state in the soil and then those larvae emerge and need to climb up something, usually the tree trunk, to get into uh, the fruit. Uh, so I know people often put little cardboard traps around trunks and try and intercept them on the way up the trunk. Um, so yeah, quite likely the tanglefoot would help. Coddling moth is another one that we haven't had a lot of around here, so I haven't got extensive documented strategies for them. 
Any other questions, guys? You've got access to cat. This is <laughs> slaters and millipedes. Do they eat plants? Um, I'm not totally sure about millipedes. Slaters can eat plants, but usually don't. And um, there is some circumstance, which I think we're not really clear on yet, something that flicks them over and sometimes they will do a lot of damage but most of the time they're just another part of your ecosystem and not an issue we have tons of slaters that never have caused damage i actually noticed that if i squash a slag or a snail the slaters are the undertakers that come in and eat them all up and um, they're gone the next morning so they're they're like the undertakers in our garden i uh, don't worry about them mm -hmm. mm. Um, okay, so Angela's asking about red spider mites. Um, she's tried spraying with water, but it takes too much water. Any other mm. ideas? Yeah, um, I, there's so many things I had to take out of the session, Angela, just to fit it within the two hour window. Um, mites are another common problem. And as you've worked out, they often are worse in hot, dusty environments. So sometimes misting with water can help a little bit. Uh, but yeah, you're right, it's hard to keep that up through a Melbourne summer. So um, one of the things that you can use for mites is sulphur. Um, yeah, it's one of those things you, you don't want to overuse it, but it's not a chemical per se, so I feel pretty comfortable using it. And um, the stuff that I use is called wettable sulphur, which allows it to be mixed with water as a spray. Uh, ordinary sulphur that you might get from a pet stock supply to change the soil pH, for example, doesn't mix well with water. So wettable sulphur is what I would have a go at. And I'm just reading Dave's comment about taking the shells off snails. You can slow them down and they become more sluggish. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never tried that before, Dave. Anyone who wants some light entertainment, you can look up um, electric fence for for snails or for slugs on the internet and there is someone out there who's built an electric fence with a wire and a battery like a normal household battery and there's footage of um, slugs and snails trying to cross it and it's actually quite hilarious uh, probably not the most practical strategy for management <laughs> that's a seriously geeky um youtube wormhole to go down <laughs> sure is. um I saw one more, uh, but I've lost it now. Um, Mary's asking about rabbits, and again, not something I have to deal with here, but that um, uh, the, the fence line, Mary, that I showed you, the floppy fence, often people will do a horizontal section at the base, sometimes buried under the soil level. And um, so that's creating like a corner, uh, so that when burrowing animals go up to the fence, they start digging, but when they dig down, they hit a horizontal layer and of course the issue there is that yeah if there's a burrow already that gets into that area or if um, you trap rabbits inside the fence then you won't control them through that way um, but I know that those um, those sorts of fences can be really effective um, and and really save a lot of effort if you can establish them without rabbits inside already mm. um, Diane's asked about borers in Santa Rosa plum mm. Um, what type of borer, Diane? Do we know much more about them? Or are they just little holes? Uh, are they in the trunk or are they in the fruit? Uh, in the trunk. trunk, yeah. Yep, I've got some of those as well. Um, there might not be a whole lot that you can do about them other than just general tree health and um, uh, encouraging predators and things that like to pick them off. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't read of any specific strategies for the borer. I would be focusing, again, just general tree health and keeping that tree as strong as possible and um, hoping that it can tolerate a level of borers. Uh, we have them outside and they're still getting excellent crops, for example. Um, there may be other things as well. That's not one that I've got in my head at this time. So, again, I'll just refer you to those sorts of sources to look them up. Mm. Alrighty, well, I think um, we might, the questions are wrapped up, so we might leave it there and let you all um, get to your Saturday afternoons and 
thanks for coming. Hope you um, join us tomorrow if you're interested in chooks. And yeah, thanks for coming along. <laughs>